Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Every day, a half million people pass through this landmark building. Probably the most famous railroad station anywhere in the world. Hello, I'm Jack Perkins, and welcome to our special presentation on the history of railroads. Locomotion. The series tells the story of railroads around the world, from their earliest beginnings to the bullet trains that speed across Japan today. The railroad is more than just another way of getting around. It's no exaggeration, I think, to say that the railroad has been the building block for modern society. Before railroads, the United States was a vast land. The rails turned it into a nation. That same thing happened in other countries and continues to happen. This 19th century invention is still relevant as we approach the 21st. Let's begin here in America, where a handful of entrepreneurs built the railroads and the opulent stations like this one, and in the process, built fortunes on a scale that till then no one had dreamed possible. ushered in a revolution in travel. In the United States, it also brought a revolution in business. Railroads were our first really big business in the United States. Other businesses were backyard tinkering operations. Oh, sometimes there was a factory, but that factory existed in one city. Railroads operated from city to city, state to state, we had never seen anything like it in the world. For 75 years, the major railway companies dominated the entire country. They were an economic force unlike any in the nation's history. Railroad barons made huge fortunes and occasionally lost them. push in American railways came in the 1860s, just after the Civil War. 1,800 miles of track were laid from the Mississippi to the West Coast. A railroad that crossed the entire country was finished in just four years. The first transcontinental railroad was the largest and greatest and am most ambitious project ever taken on in the United States up until the time it was constructed. It took large armies of forces of men to uh, build the railroad. They didn't have automatic machinery in those days. It took uh, a lot of horsepower, manpower, and plenty of perseverance to get the job done. also required more capital than had ever been raised before. In the 1860s, brokers sold railroad stock in an outdoor market on Wall Street in New York. Stock speculation was new to Americans, and it became a rage. For the first time, people who had nothing to do with finance became involved in speculation. Women were coming down from uptown and standing in line at brokerage houses in order to take a gamble 
on railroad stocks. Clergymen were, were gambling on railroad stocks. Uh, the lunch counter, the first fast food restaurant in the world, was invented in New York in the early 1860s because people didn't have time to go back home for lunch. They had to have fast food, so it was invented for them. And that was mostly due to railroad speculation. Mm -hmm. Railroads created a new American elite. Financiers like J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and Jay Gould. They profited from a boom that would last until the First World War. In 1870, Americans bought two and a half billion dollars worth of railroad stock. Over the next 20 years, that would quadruple. My grandfather was a clerk on the exchange at the turn of the century. On a very hot summer day, all the windows were open. There was no air conditioning, of course. And he was counting stock certificates, and a breeze wafted through the office and picked up a certificate for 5,000 shares of the New York and Haven and Hartford Railroad and floated it out the other window and where it floated down onto Pine Street. And my grandfather was then 17 or 18 years old, went running down the stairs as fast as he could run and out onto Pine Street. And there, much to his relief, was approximately a million dollars in railroad securities lying in the gutter. Nobody paid any attention to it. Laying thousands of miles of track was one thing. Making it profitable was another. The Transcontinental Railroad made it possible to get across the country over what was called the Great American Desert, that is west of the Mississippi River. And there was nothing there. And the railroads were granted lands on either side of the railroad as not only an aid to the construction, but to provide populace to support the railroad after it was built. The railroad companies had a financial interest in settling the new lands to the west, so they ran immigrant trains. Entire families traveled with all their worldly goods, including livestock and farm machinery. The railroads offered free travel and cheap land. It was enough to entice settlers from the East Coast and even from many countries in Europe. They headed to America's western frontier, filled with hope for a better life. My grandparents saw ads in the papers and they um, indicated that life in America would be superior to that of any place else. And Germany was having problems at that time with the uh, political problems. And the land was becoming crowded and so a lot of people were anxious to seek something better. <laughs> The mass colonization of the West continued into the 20th century. As late as 1910, the railways were actively recruiting farmers from Europe. They were needed to build new towns and cities along the tracks. Everyone was to benefit, especially the railroad companies. In order to lure even more settlers, the railways created a new specialty, men called colonization agents. A colonization agent, which was what my father was for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad, was a person who went back east and actually recruited people to come back to the Midwest and to settle along the railroad lines. And they would actually say, you know, come out where the air is good and the land is plentiful and the land is also cheap. Well, my grandmother was very disappointed and uh, could hardly believe what she was seeing because in her homeland of Germany, there were a lot of trees. And when they arrived at the homestead, all she could see was a treeless plain. But she decided that this was her choice and she would make the best of whatever came. The families moved to barren prairies that had never been farmed, 
There was no timber to build houses to protect them from a harsh climate, nothing that could be called comfortable. This land of opportunity was filled with hardship. My grandmother had several barrels outside of the sod house door. These she filled with snow so that she would have water for cooking and washing. It was a very difficult life. My father would look for desirable people. And uh, the desirable people they were looking for were those that they knew would be successful, those who were going to be able to take it. As he worked with people, he would say, if you prosper, then we, the railroads, are going to prosper also. So they would actually advertise this. You prosper, we prosper. The railroads had made an offer and wanted something in return, something that would make their investment worthwhile. The farmers were expected to do more than just survive. They were expected to be successful, to grow crops that would be shipped back east on the railroad. Railroad economics are very different from, say, manufacturing economics because in manufacturing economics, if you're not making money, you can close down the factory until demand picks up. But railroads are, first, they're extremely capital intensive. You have to have the right of way, you have to have the road bed, you have to have the tracks, you have to have the rolling stock, um, and you have to keep to a regular schedule, which means the train runs whether it's empty or full. Because of the peculiarities of transportation economics, it was in the railroad's interest to go out there and promote aggressively business, to teach farmers how to grow better crops and more crops. They educated them. They had schools on wheels, if you will. And these were called uh, educational trains. And they might be about 10 cars long. The cars would be gutted out, and then they would have exhibits. The people would come through. Sometimes as many as 3,000 people would go through one particular train. Now, the towns knew that they were coming because there was a lot of advertising that had gone on beforehand. In some instances, the businesses would have uh, their little homemade displays that would talk about the train that was coming. And uh, then they also would have flyers. The high school bands would be there. <laughs> Children would be involved in making posters, and sometimes they'd dress up, maybe as chickens if it was the poultry special train. In fact, the poultry train was an important one, I thought, because for many, many years we had the talking rooster up in our attic that was on that train. Railroads didn't just create small towns, they also built a city called Chicago. The birth of the Windy City when locomotion continues. Hey family, ready for a great deal from the Big Red Boat? Well, your ship just came in. Save $700 on a Walt Disney World vacation and Bahamas cruise. A four-night cruise with non-stop entertainment, 24-hour child care, complete youth programs, and two exotic ports of call in the Bahamas, Nassau, and exclusive Port Lucaya. Plus three nights at the Walt Disney World Resort. Call Carlson Vaganly Travel at 1-800-652-SHIP. What does your copier think of the paper you put in it? Oh, good. He's coming to feed me. I'm starving. 
Oh, no. It's not great white paper. Now I'm really going to get in a jam. Copiers worry about the paper you feed them, so Union Camp created great white recycled content paper. It's virtually worry-free. So it's as good for your business as it is for the environment. Great white, only from Union Camp. One less thing to worry about. He's got to change my diet. <laughs> Are we having a bad day? Introducing the TL series from Acura. features of its luxury class competitors at a very competitive price. The Acura TL series. Once again, we've taken the concept of luxury in an entirely new direction. See the new powerful Acura 3.2 TL now at your Acura dealer. Hey, you're in a hurry, right? That's okay, because what I'm going to tell you is going to save you a lot of time and money. You see, Office Depot's now selling Windows 95. Here, take a look. Low price, huh? Office Depot guarantees it. Installation and support are also available. On site, in your home or office. Plus, Office Depot guarantees low prices on memory upgrades, hard drives, everything you need. Hey, where are you going? The commercial's not over yet. Taking care of business. We'll pull the plug. Locomotion, A&E's look at the story of railroads, continues. In the late 1800s, in the Midwest and beyond, the railroads determined exactly where thousands of new cities and towns would be built. At that time, uh, the locomotives would only operate about 100 miles across, and it was usually a full day to get across that 100 miles, especially with a freight train. So as a result, they would set up a little terminal about every 100 miles. And this terminal consisted of not only a station, but it would have a hotel and an eating house, usually shops. And of course, that's what also brought in uh, manpower. Uh, it was railroad workers, too, that, uh, that created the towns. New towns seemed to spring up almost overnight. The story is told of one train filled with household goods. It pulled to a stop in the middle of the prairie. There was nothing there, but the conductor made an announcement. Gentlemen, here's Julesburg. With those words, still another railway town was born. And if a town's location didn't suit the railroad, it would have to be moved. Over at little town of Plum Creek, where they were going to make a station, UP Railroad uh, said, well, we won't make a stop unless you move your town to one of our sections. And so uh, in about 1882, 1883, somewhere in that area, a little town of Plum Creek was moved just to the west, about a half a mile, so it would be on a railroad section. Joe Jeffrey's great-grandfather, Bill Robb, was a plumber. He noticed a Union Pacific advertisement and headed west to be a rancher, raising hogs and cattle, a business that was impossible before the railroad. We're standing right here on the Oregon Trail. The Pony Express and the Oregon Trail are right where we're standing right now. We're right through thousands and thousands of wagons, but the delivery system was very inadequate. And by having the railroads come here, great granddad could load the cattle that he was raising, put them on the livestock cars and ship them to the markets back east. Bill Robb would eventually buy more than 30,000 acres of land from the Union Pacific. The family fortune would depend on the railroads for another three generations. Sundays was a great event around here. We would all gather down to the stockyards and load train after train. It seemed like, to me as a youngster, that we just never got through loading cattle. It was a great event to watch the cattle go in the boxcars. Railroads transformed the great American Midwest into one of the most productive agricultural regions in the world. And every product was shipped by rail to new markets that had opened in Chicago. Trains filled with livestock terminated at the giant Chicago stockyards. Just a mile square, think of that. A mile square of stockyard pens, Livestock move in in the morning, unloaded from the trains. 
At least for a young man like myself, what I was like, 20, uh, and eyes wide open, it was really a, a very exciting place to be. And, uh, you know, there must have been uh, 20,000 people working in the plants. The tremendous growth of the meatpacking business was made possible by the refrigerator car. A simple device, a wagon that could be filled and refilled with ice. But its commercial implications were enormous. Meat could now be butchered in one central location, then shipped frozen thousands of miles across the country. Within a decade, meatpacking went from being a seasonal business to a multi-million dollar enterprise. In 1900, the stockyards were bought by a railroad, the Chicago Junction, or CJ. For thousands of workers, life revolved around the CJ and its schedule. The CJ, we all call it the CJ. And you, if you were working on a loading dock, the man said, the CJ's going to be here. Your boss said, it's, they're coming for a 3 o'clock full. I want every one of those cars filled now, and no fooling around. And he said, jump to it. You worked like the dickens, speed up, speed up, speed up to make the pull. That was crucial to make the pull. If the car didn't go that night, it was going to have to lay over the next day. It meant unhooking the car. It meant all kinds of misery. So the railroads really ran the tempo of uh, the shipping departments. Engines coming. Be ready for the pull. Chicago was gradually transformed into the world's busiest railroad center. It was the hub of 11 lines fanning out across the continent. The city became the magnet for enterprise. Railroad companies like the Chicago Junction developed new businesses to guarantee a constant supply of freight. The central manufacturing district, built by the railroads, brought all kinds of new factories into existence. They turned out everything from industrial machinery to chewing gum. The companies operated on a new scale because their products could now be sold everywhere in the country. With railroads, you can have national markets for great big capital intensive manufacturing enterprises like steel. The great industrial boom in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century would not have been possible had the railroads not been there because you couldn't have these enormous economies of scale that made these companies very profitable without the railroads to sell all over the country. And for the settlers on the prairie, Chicago was the source of all of life's necessities. Sears Roebuck pioneered a new type of business, mail order. Edward Sears was a former railroad station manager. He began his career when he sold a box of unclaimed watches. By 1900, Sears was the undisputed king of American merchandisers. Well, the biggest thrill of my life was that when I was 10 years old, I received a Beckwith upright piano as a birthday gift, and it came from Sears Roebuck. It arrived in Eustis by train. It was crated in a wooden box, and they were able to load this big piano onto the lumber wagon. And I recall it was just getting dusk as they arrived home. And I was so excited that I was hardly able to play, but I remembered that my father liked a little tune long, long ago. And so I stumbled through that for them, and they all clapped, and I was thrilled to pieces because now I could take music lessons on a piano. Railroads were a source of pleasure for both Ruth Kugler and millions of others. They were also the source of some of the greatest fortunes ever assembled. We'll meet the robber barons who took greed to new heights when Locomotion continues. When a traffic jam was two cars in the same town, Mobile Oil was there. When Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic, Mobile was on board. Mobile was in the world's first minivans, in the first space shuttle, and in the tanks of Desert Storm. 
We've been helping engines last for a long time. Mobile, changing oil for over 125 years. Are you out there, AT&T? Of course you are. You're not gonna like this. You know how all along you've been telling us at MCI to put it in writing? Sort of implying that we weren't telling the truth about our savings. Well, a proof of savings statement. We're sending them to our friends and family customers, showing them how they save. Put it in writing. I hate to say it, AT&T, but you asked for it. Television's biggest event this fall, A&E's Premier Week, beginning September 3rd, only on A&E. Fact. With banks, you're guaranteed to never receive more than 7% on your money. Fact. So-called securities like stocks and bonds are far from being secure. Fact. With government-regulated commodities exchange-traded options, all of your risks are predetermined, but your profit potentials are unlimited. Fact. Right now, due to record export demand, a shortage is developing in grain supplies, creating opportunities that are staggering. Call Universal Commodity Corporation today for the facts on how $5,000 invested in the right market at the right time could turn into $20,000 or more in less than three months. Call now to see if you qualify to receive a comprehensive information kit that explains all the facts. There is no cost or obligation, so call Universal Commodity Corporations today and discover which commodities to profit from in the 90s. We now return to Locomotion here on A&E. In the early 1900s, there was nothing more glamorous than taking a train. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. The Rock Island Line is a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you fight it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. As more and more railroads were built, there was growing competition for passengers and freight. Oh, the Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. The Rock Island Line is a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you fight it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. The competitive climate began during the land grant era when railroads first were uh, constructed from the Mississippi River to the uh, West Coast. In many cases, only one line would receive the uh, land, and so you had speculators building uh, competing routes in an attempt to keep the competition from completing their route and gaining the land. Railroads actually employed armies, and they had cannon on the route. And while the uh, railroads were being built, cannon would blast away at uh, each of the uh, groups of builders. There were an awful lot of uh, workmen that were uh, killed back uh, then from these uh, competing armies. Oh, the Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. Well, it's a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you can ride it like you fight it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. Well, they would often, in competing with each other, build uneconomic railroads. They would build a parallel set of tracks. For instance, in, in 1860, there were only 30,000 miles of railroad track in the United States. By 1890, there were about 210,000 miles of railroad track, many of them duplicate and, and wasteful. Before the Rock Island Line is a mighty good road, well, it's a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you fight it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. If you look, for example, between New York and Chicago, there were five railroads that were competing. Uh, there are even stories of uh, one railroad uh, having cut its rates for moving cattle, uh, was inundated with uh, cattle from a competing railroad. The uh, belief of the competing railroad was that they were losing money on every cow that they shipped, and if enough cows could be shipped on the competitor's railroad, that uh, railroad might fall into bankruptcy. The railroads actually had a monopoly in a lot of areas. So therefore, they could set their own freight rates. 
and uh, the farmer, of course, was subject to whatever those rates would have been, and it would have been impossible for him to have hauled his products any great distance. And he lost money because of the higher freight rates, and it cost, uh, caused a lot of hard feelings between the railroads and the farmers. Farmers felt that the railroads had uh, exploited them, that this monopoly had uh, uh, been created and had simply st was stealing their produce by their monopolistic rates was just driving them to, to the poorhouse. And a whole political movement, the populist political movement, grew up in the rural areas particularly as a result of this feeling. Popular opinion turned against the railroads and the men who ran them. They were no longer seen as creators of opportunity. Instead, railroad speculators and tycoons became famous for business practices that were unfair, to put it mildly. The shenanigans they were up to were almost without end. For one thing, they would issue stock without any warning. They would just print 100,000 shares and dump it on the market without anybody knowing about it ahead of time. And of course, if you were trying to buy control of a railroad and the management of that railroad suddenly doubled the number of shares outstanding, it made it much more difficult to get control. And in 1868, that's exactly what the Erie Railway did when Commodore Vanderbilt was trying to buy control. They simply printed it. Vanderbilt bought $7 million worth of stock in the Erie Railroad. Jay Gould, owner of the Erie, put Vanderbilt's money in a carpet bag and fled Wall Street for an armed fort across the river. Jay Gould operated in a business world that was pre-regulation as we understand it today. Uh, it was a free-for-all time. Uh, the rules were very loose to the extent there were any rules. I think Jay enjoyed a rather bad publicity throughout his life. There were times when he endeavored to uh, cure it, to deal with it, and he, I think, bought a newspaper at one time or perhaps one or two uh, burnish his image a little bit through that newspaper. The robber barons had few scruples. Sometimes they bought newspapers, sometimes they bought politicians. The relationship with politicians was often, well, shall we say, intimate. New York state government was very, very, very corrupt in the 1860s. Um, the legislature could be bought, the governor could be bought, the judges could be bought, and they all were bought. And um, bribery was really the only way to get business done. Um, because if you didn't bribe the legislature to get the law the way you wanted it, your opponent would bribe the legislature to get the law the way he wanted it. And very often you'd end up with both sides bribing the legislature and the legislature having a fine time. And, um, of course, the people's interest was not very important here. One railroad business exemplified the growing chasm between the millions of people who rode the railroads and the handful of men who owned them. The Pullman Palace Car Company of Chicago set new standards for comfort. Pullman became synonymous with first-class travel. Their sleeping and dining cars ran on railroads around the world. George Pullman's designs were innovative. He was the first to install electric lights. He recruited expert cabinet makers from Germany to build his luxurious cars. Pullman not only had a factory that built the cars, Pullman also was an idealist in some respects, who wanted to create an industrial community where his workers at his plant would both live and work. A community with parks and with water supply and a church. In 1889, the company was worth $43 million. 12,000 workers lived in this model community. George Pullman trumpeted his success with his own traveling band. But George Pullman and his empire were about to be hit by a strike. We'll look at one of the most violent episodes in the history of American labor when locomotion continues. Hey, you're in a hurry, right? That's okay, because what I'm going to tell you is going to save you a lot of time and money. You see, Office Depot's now selling Windows 95. Here, take a look. Low price, huh? Office Depot guarantees it. Installation and support are also available. On-site, in your home or office. 
Plus, Office Depot guarantees low prices on memory upgrades, hard drives, everything you need. Hey, where are you going? The commercial's not over yet. Taking care of business. We'll pull the plug. Mr. Sampras, you know why you're here, don't you? I'm kind of dumb. We'll fix that. Let's see. You go up to the umpire. You say, you were wrong. You were wrong. Squat a few balls, throw a few rackets. The ball was in. The ball was in. I'm incompetent. Yell at me. Say the motto. Or two. And eat your pizza the wrong way. Crust first. Why didn't you say so? Stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut. With a zesty new sauce and cheese baked into a new thinner crust, you'll want to eat it crust first. Two at once. I've created a monster. Large, just $9.99. The Infiniti i30 is truly an extraordinary luxury car. It has a revolutionary micro-finished V6 that can out-accelerate many luxury V8s. It comes with patented rear multi-link beam suspension that allows for superb handling. And it does something all $30,000 luxury cars should do. Perform. Four days. Okay, yes, sir, we've had a problem here. Three astronauts. Situation is serious. Two choices. Immediately, I thought, survival. One show. This is the 20th century. Relive what really happened in this life and death drama. By the skin of our, our fingernails. Crisis in Space, the real story of Apollo 13 on the 20th century. Tonight, only on A&E. Here's an uplifting thought for the weary traveler. Come home to Sealy's most advanced posturepedic ever for the back support you need. Now, the only foundation made from steel beams, not wood, is redesigned to be even stronger. Now, Sealy has a more sensitive sense and respond coil system, and its patented sensory arm senses and cushions your movement, then responds to your weight with increasing support, correct support, making Sealy America's favorite destination. Posturepedic support, only from Sealy. We now return to Locomotion, here on A&E. As money poured into his company, George Pullman built a village for his workers, a way to make even more money. And he did it not out of the goodness of his heart, but his notion was that this is the most profitable way to operate. Because if you have a community of your workers right handy to your shops, and they're not allowed to go to saloons. There can't be no saloon in this town. Everybody will have to be sober and get into no trouble. That means they'll get to work on time. And uh, he could do it all and make money, too, because he would be charging these people rent. And he would get his 6% for the Pullman Company off of those houses. Hey, no landlords in Chicago will be making that money. He'll be making it. Great. Except that when the Depression came, the, uh, the Depression of 93, a panic, uh, orders for Pullman cars dropped off, and he did what came very naturally to a corporate uh, tycoon. He decided to cut the wages and to lay off the people. And uh, the people said, well, well, then cut the rent. And he said, no, no cutting the rent. I've got to get the 6%. 6% is sacred. I told my stockholders, 6%. In 1894, Pullman's employees walked off the job in protest. Thousands of other rail workers went on a sympathy strike. Rail traffic throughout the United States was brought to a screeching halt. The dispute turned violent. 34 people were killed. Railroad property was set on fire. Finally, on Independence Day, 12,000 federal troops Nearly half the army were sent in to restore order. Union leaders were thrown in jail. As a result of this strike, the great reputation of George Pullman became the, the symbol of all that was wrong with American capitalism in the minds of the American working class. He was reviled. This man was so afraid that when he died and was buried, he ordered that his, his uh, grave be interlocked with rails welded together, bolted together to, to restrain grave robbers who might dig him up and desecrate him. That was the temper of the time.
The so-called robber barons, Pullman, Vanderbilt, Fisk, were the most despised men in America, symbols of capitalism at its worst. Political cartoonists had a field day, and their favorite target was Jay Gould. Here's a delightful cartoon of uh, Jay uh, in a little swing where his uh, interest in uh, communications are strangling the press and commerce. We see Jay Gould playing in Wall Street, uh, entitled Jay Gould's Private Bowling Alley. And then here is a really bitter one in which Sage, Field, Vanderbilt, and Gould are seen being supported by the working people who are barely able to keep their heads above water while the monopolists sit on top with their millions. Widespread anti-railroad sentiment prompted the government to take action. In 1887, Congress established the Interstate Commerce Commission with power to regulate the railroads. Regulation for the railroads meant that they no longer were in charge of their destiny. They no longer were able to give rebates to preferred customers. Regulation meant that railroads had to ask permission of the Interstate Commerce Commission to establish a rate. As a result, price no longer was a means of competition. <laughs> In 1916, with the United States about to enter World War I, President Wilson nationalized the railroads. He took control of the industry away from railroad bosses and gave it to a newly created body called the Railway Administration. It was during the Railroad Administration that the unions became powerful and the establishment of the eight-hour day and abolition of piecework. For example, uh, uh, cleaning a spittoon had a number and a price. I forget the number, but the price was half of one cent because I helped make those payrolls in those days. Replacing piecework with an eight-hour day was the first of many concessions granted to workers during the war. These new rules would be extremely costly to railroads. Their effects would be felt for decades. A rule was imposed providing that for every hundred miles a train traveled, a crew would receive a full day's pay. Well, that made a lot of sense at World War I because we had steam locomotives. They periodically had to be stopped to be recoaled and be rewatered, and the average speed was about 12 and a half miles an hour or 100 miles in an eight-hour period. But by the time we reached World War II and later, we were moving trains at 60, 70 miles an hour. The result was that a crew received multiple days' wages for fewer than eight hours of work. After the war, the railroads were returned to private hands, but tracks and rolling stock were worn out. The expense of repairing them had to be carried by the companies themselves. At the same time, the manufacturing businesses the railroads had helped create were starting to develop their own new forms of transportation. Trucks had come of age during World War I, there was one thing standing in their way for civilian use in the United States, the lack of paved highways. In 1919, a young army colonel named Dwight Eisenhower led a convoy of trucks across the country from Washington to San Francisco. The trip was highly publicized. Its mission, to demonstrate the potential of trucking and to lobby Congress for a national network of new roads. Whenever possible, they traveled on the Lincoln Highway, a road built right beside the old Union Pacific tracks. This was hardly a joy ride. Bad conditions made the journey next to impossible. The convoy's average speed slightly less than six miles an hour. Not quite so good, Eisenhower wrote, as even the slowest troop train.
Three months after it began in Washington, the convoy arrived in San Francisco. It drew a lot of newspaper attention at that time, of course. My father, who was then a, a locomotive engineer, uh, suggested to me that uh, if he were having to live his life over again, even in choosing a profession, he thought he would get into the road business rather than the railroad business because roads and trucks and vehicles of that kind, that kind of transportation was certainly going to outdistance the railroads and put them out of business probably. or no roads, the automobile gave Americans a new sense of liberation. They could suddenly travel when and where they wanted. In the Roaring Twenties, the car posed a serious challenge to passenger trains. But prosperity didn't last. The great stock market crash of 1929 was a setback for the auto industry. For the railroads, it was even worse. Locomotion will continue in a moment. Taste this. It's something different for your sensitive teeth. Mm, tastes great, but my dentist wants me to use Sensodyne. This is Sensodyne. Sensodyne Cool Gel. Hey, no pain. All I feel is cool and clean. Sensodyne Cool Gel. All you feel is cool and clean. Your kid has a cold. That's uh, one of our vice presidents uh, having a bad day. Your computer has a virus. Well, I could get a new diaper. I mean, I could uh, try and decipher it. The last thing you want to worry about now is paper jamming. We're uh, having an earthquake, I think. So you want great white recycled content paper from Union Camp. It's as good for your business as it is for the environment. It's virtually worry-free because you've got enough to worry about. Can I get back to you? Great white, only from Union Camp. One less thing to worry about. Introducing the TL series from Acura. features of its luxury class competitors at a very competitive price. The Acura TL series. Once again, we've taken the concept of luxury in an entirely new direction. See the new powerful Acura 3.2 TL now at your Acura dealer. Ernest Hemingway called her the most exciting woman of his generation. Oh, she was wicked. <laughs> She was wicked. She didn't give a damn. Spirited, sensual, fiercely independent, and one of the most beautiful stars to ever grace the silver screen. The Extraordinary Life of Ava Gardner. A biography. Tomorrow, only on a and &E. Hey, family, ready for a great deal from the Big Red Boat? Well, your ship just came in. Save $700 on a Walt Disney World vacation and Bahamas cruise. A four-night cruise with nonstop entertainment, 24-hour child care, complete youth programs, and two exotic ports of call in the Bahamas, Nassau, and exclusive Port Lucaya. Plus three nights at the Walt Disney World Resort. Call Carlson Vagenly Travel at 1-800-652-SHIP. Look, I just invented something amazing. New 2000 flushes, blue plus bleach. Powerful blue detergent plus stain-fighting chlorine bleach. Two cleans in one for up to four months. New 2000 flushes, blue plus bleach. Two cleans in one. We now return to Locomotion here on A&E. After World War II, a new animal appeared on the American landscape. It was a beautiful creature. It was this great silver uh, snake with lights that went wow, wow, wow. And this wonderful new kind of a horn. Not the old toot toot of the steam engine, but here is this wailing, honking thing that told you you better get out of the way. To win back passengers, the railroads introduced new high speed, streamlined trains. Streamline fail, fastest train that run, hot water spray, ain't gonna help you none, I'm gonna leave in the morning. 
baby on that stream last night. Only thing I can say, mama, get your mind off of this thing. That was the quickest way of getting across the country. You could start from here around 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the evening. And it, uh, at the best, these best trains that I wanted to take you two nights to get into California. Yes. They were nice, fine trains. And the ones I run on towards the last had everything on there that you could imagine. They had a maid on there, and they had a secretary on there, and just nearly everything that a home would have, nearly. The Streamliners borrowed heavily from the competition. They took diesel engines from trucks and their styling from cars. The inaugural run of the newest in streamlined trains. It's fun tuning in at 110 miles an hour. A society occasion from New York to Sun Valley in Idaho. Telephone, too. They are Mr. and Mrs. Averill Harriman. Swank on wheels. The streamliner did not bring back the passenger traffic. You just could not get enough people on a train to make it pay. In 1932, a group of railroad lawyers met in Washington. And their luncheon speaker was Amelia Earhart, a very cheeky woman. She had flown across the, uh, the Atlantic. And she got before these railroad executives. They were sitting in the audience, smoking their cigars, having a good old time. And she suggested that someday airplanes might actually take business away from railroads. Well, these railroad lawyers just erupted in laughter. Today, after months of preparation, an hourly air service starts between New York, Philadelphia, and Washington. The officers of the line believe they offer something new in air transportation to the public. The railroad uh, people had a little saying against the trucks, uphill slow, downhill fast, tonnage first, safety last. Trucks had begun by transporting goods to the railroad station, but by the 1940s, they were going door to door, bypassing railroads entirely. The truck pulls up to the dock, so it becomes much more direct. Eliminates totally this problem of uh, repackaging and reshipping and rerouting that uh, the, the railroads fix to their uh, freight car lines, to their uh, tracks, and they're stuck with. As the railroads were overtaken, so were the great Chicago stockyards, themselves a creation of the railroads. Cattle could now be purchased at regional markets, transported to local meat packers, then carried directly to customers, all by truck. Railroads began their, their final march to almost extinction after World War II. And in the 1950s, an interstate highway system was built in the United States. It literally cloned the railroad system. And for a number of railroads, the last time they earned a profit was moving concrete to build the interstate highway system. During the 1960s and 70s, railroads lost their battle against the competition. Various lines went bankrupt. Those that survived would struggle to remain profitable. A few commuter lines were deemed a public necessity to be supported by the taxpayer. Less than a century after the robber barons, the golden age of American railroads was over.
The United States was, in fact, united by the railroad. But the railroad was actually perfected on the other side of the Atlantic. In the early 1800s, our old enemy England was the industrial leader of the world, more advanced in everything, including railroads. Next, locomotion traces how railroads have transformed entire civilizations and the world itself, from the early days of steam engines through the bullet trains of today. Locomotion will continue in a moment. A&E Home Video presents Locomotion, the amazing world of trains. From the iron horse to the bullet train, this is the story of the machine that revolutionized the world. Call 1-800-423-1212 and order this collector edition box set. All four episodes of Locomotion on four video cassettes for $79.95 plus shipping and handling. Call now, 1-800-423-1212. For four days, NASA struggled to save three astronauts from becoming lost in space. We'll relive the harrowing events of the Apollo 13 mission when its former astronauts recount their tale of survival. Join us for a special edition of 